<laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We are very lucky to have Nilda Kalinupa Alvarez share with us about her journey of the founding of the Centro de Textiles Tradicionales del Cusco to revive Quechua textile traditions and to empower weavers, especially women of the Andean region of Cusco, Peru. First, let me share a little bit about her. Nilda Kalinupa Alvarez was born in the small community of Chinchero, Peru. Like many of other children during this time, she was responsible for taking care of her family's flock of sheep, watching over them in the fields. She spent her time learning to spin and to weave with her friends. As she grew and learned more complex designs, her curiosity was sparked. She could see that there was a powerful history behind the art of her people that was slowly becoming lost. When Nilda was a teenager, she befriended an ethnobotanist and an anthropologist who had moved to Chinchero in the 1970s. With their encouragement, she embarked on a journey that would change the fate of the Cusco textiles. After becoming the first person from her community to attend college, she went on to become one of the founders of CTTC. And since her youth, Nilda has been a community organizer and leader, bringing her town together behind the goal of reviving their textile traditions. Now as the director of the Centro de Textiles Tradicionales del Cusco, also an award-winning author of multiple books on Peruvian weaving, an international speaker, and an expert um, in the textiles of her region, Nilda cannot believe how far the center has come since its early days as a group of friends meeting to weave in each other's homes. I am honored to introduce you to our special guest who is connecting with us all the way from Peru. Welcome, Nilda. Thank you very much, Ruben. And let me get into this. Um, I wonder, Ruben, can you help me? Can you see the screen? This yes, is, we can see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Perfect. So. Great. <laughs> um, what I can say first, I would like to thank you to the New York Textile Month. I didn't even know before. I'm sorry about my ignorance. Um, I would like to thank you to Robin to get involved in this special program. Um, tonight in this presentation, I would like to share uh, some stories of this uh, textile world, of the Andean textile world and the project of the Centro Textiles Tradicionales del Cusco. Uh, it's going to be a great pleasure um, to be with you and I thank to the assistant because in that way I get uh, encouraged, support psychologically. This project is not a single-handed project. It had been um, managed by uh, many groups of people and generous institutions and just the textile lovers of Peru, our researchers and weavers, special weavers. So, that's all about that. Um, I am very pleased to come from a culture of very rich, rich textile tradition and diversity of the textiles. Um, our textiles are very important part of our legacy, identity, political rules, beauty of our clothing, uh, plays important roles in our rituals, like Mother Earth, our animals, fertility uh, of the Mother Earth and the animals, or just the two things to the life. So I'm just going to share that with you tonight. Um, as you can see in this uh, photo when this presentation, you know, there's a little bit of different types of hats, different types of skirts, ponchos, and many uh, garments that's part of our identity. 
We don't need a presentation card. We need different types of traditional clothing in our culture to present ourselves. The artistic point, the capacity, the ability, the patience, the passion of a weaver is uh, manifested during the in this process of the weaving and the how you come out with a textile. So there are special textiles used in special events, or there are just simple textiles, which are also beauty in some ways. Uh, to you to be used in everyday life. Even though today many of these textiles have been put in the um, way of in danger, because there is many textiles produced massively in factories or maybe floor looms producing quantities of yardage. Meanwhile, our traditional textiles have been unique in the size, in the type, in the color presentation, and the iconography for each case. Um, textiles are part of our family, community, and region. Textiles uh, play such important roles in you know, like in our rituals. We are still part of that, even though in the last generations it's changing quite a bit. And we have learned from the elders, many of these traditions and some ayat very strongly carried this offering ceremonies for different occasions. The fertility of our animal is the survival of the life. Alpacas, you know, is the most appreciated favor and lucky of those who, have, who live in the areas where they have many alpacas. That's their wealth and that's the wealth in the economy, but also in the social life and the production of the textiles, of course. Um, Alpacas, llamas, and any other animals very much respected in the Indian culture because it's part of our life. The baby alpacas or the baby animals are treated like little small children with that huge respect and love. Um, the reproduction of the animals, it's what provides the food for the Indian people uh, the clothes from the fiber and the first, uh, the manure is the most important uh, fertilizer for the land to grow mainly potatoes or one of the crops. Also the bones were used for the weaving tools as a weaving so very much everything we will use you know from our animals. Offerings during the fertility season which is the um, months of uh, end of January and February, in some way or another way, in the big flock or just family or very personal events will happen. To think to the Mother Earth, to the mountains, will graze our animals. So families got together or communities get together and after this happens, this events. Um, after that, you know, all the process of our weaving comes. Share the wool, share the fiber, the spinning process, you know, using the drop spindle or suspended spindle like this lady in the right from Pitumarca holding the spindle in the little bowl of ceramic. Drop spindles are carried with us wherever we go. Drop spindles is the first tool that we touch as a little girls or little boys in our family or in our community. Uh, the first production of yarn never going to be uh, the best quality of yarn, but with the practice you master. Um, the little girls always as a present or part of our everyday activity, they will get spindles 
you know, and practice and practice and practice. Some of us, we get so much engaged with this and we will continue. This is how it starts the circle of our um, weaver's world. You start touching the first spindle and the wool or fiber, and you end up with this, the life of your weaving circle with the dwarf spindle. You might get blended, weak, as a, you get elder, but you can still hold your dwarf spindle and the wool. Then after you spin, produce your yarn, you have to make the colors. Andean people, we are very famous in really much loving the colors. So we like to do, even though with that, I'm not saying we only use dyed colors. We also use natural colors in some types of textiles. But color is what gives life to the Andean textile. So. Uh, following our passion, we have reintroduced the natural dye since 1998 in the 10 communities that we work. Today, we produce textiles only from the natural dyed colors or natural colors of alpaca. So in some areas, in the higher areas, we have only few natural dyes. Many of them comes from the Amazon, or what we call eye brown of the jungle, which is the starting point uh, to the Amazon. The aniline dyes had been used maybe a couple centuries in the Andean culture. That's why natural dye kind of practice disappeared, but now it's coming back. Now it's again in danger because the uh, yarn companies had been copying the colors, what we get from the natural dyes. And today there are available wool, especially in the natural dyed color shapes in the yarn shops. So many weavers, they are not bothering to dye again because there is big effort that goes into the natural dye, getting the dyes, the materials, sorting out, getting reading, and boiling, um, many another process. And if we like very intense colors, we have to over dye a lot of times. We work with 10 communities with the central. They are formed as a weaver's association. In each community, we provide um, natural dyes because they don't have many of those dyes. And this is one of these days that we have to do. So if a station is of 50 weavers or 70 weavers, everybody has to put their skins of the yarn market and we boil it in this huge pot. Usually it takes three full time work to get like 13, 14, 15 colors. And sometimes they continue dying after that with the leftovers of the yarn. Um, our 100 liters of pad or 120 liters pad will be full with the dye materials and the yarn. Uh, we need quite a bit of energy. So it's very much welcome demand in this community, especially in the groups of the women. So a lot of times has to come husbands to help. There are quantities of yarn and quantities of the dye materials. After that, you have to, you know, take out, keep using the same water to dye another colors or to mix with another dyes or to over dye. We use just the basic uh, types of mordants and some colors doesn't require mordants even. In the afternoon, usually sorting the yarn, recognizing your skins, uh, separating the skins and checking out if the color came out all right. Okay. Um, we have many issues with the natural dye. One of the big issues is water source during the dry season. I like to dye after rainy season, which is March, April, or maybe February, but it's still rainy season. So you have advantage and disadvantage. 
there were days when rains full days so you get so wet and your water and your pads doesn't boil well but there are times like this and um, during the month of july uh, it's totally dry in this area, Acopia, there is water source from the lake, but in the Anore areas, like in Maui Pampa, which is Mara's area, they don't have water, they have to bring from far away. So it's challenging, first. Second is the amount of the um, wood to fire those huge pots. We start usually early, or they start one day before, they put the water, and then somebody has to start, you know, around four, Boiling water in the high altitude is a big deal. At the end of the day, you put it all the group of the yarns, and then very soon we are going to start recognizing the weavers will start recognizing the uh, skins of the yarn, start washing and take home. After you die, you get your colors after you, everything you have whatever colors you have or whatever colors you plan to do, start warping, setting up your warp. This is the vertical warping in the Andean culture. Um, one type of warping, the previous one vertical, and the next one is horizontal warp. In this case, they are doing warp this continuous weaving, and probably it's going to be warp and weft to this continuous weaving, which is pre-Columbian technique, and that has to be done in the horizontal type of warping. Then our world is backstrap loom. Backstrap that you start from the very basic looms, narrow looms, hundreds of those little looms you have to manage in order that you have to learn the designs. And, you know, um, then you will go little by little to the belts and continue. In some case, moms or your friend, your neighbors will help you to, especially to a start point of how to handle the wider looms after your little looms. Two types of pickup we use in the Andean culture. Finger pickup, usually for the warp complementary weaving here to the right. Hold, drop, pick up the bottom thread, that's how to do it. Meanwhile, here in the left side, this lady is holding with the right hand a little stick, and with that, she's checking, picking up the pattern, which is full in the mantle. So finger pickup, stick pickup, or bone pickup, those two types. In this left case, it's warp supplementary weaving technique, which means she's just picking or dropping the red colors or the dark colors. Meanwhile, in this right case, she's doing complementary weaving design. So when she picks up from the bottom two threads, let's say, she has to drop from the top two threads. So creating design with the different colors in both sides. With this project um, of the Center of the Textiles Tradicionales de Cusco, I have experienced or I had the luck to meet um, and to see how some weavers some master weavers become to be extremely fine and complex weavers. Unfortunately, many of these ladies of their age, you know, like around 55, 60, and this COVID even made a more damage in the eyesight. So many of them right now, they can't do anymore what they were doing like when they were 35 years old, 30 or 40. So this masterpieces, amazingly, have been produced in different means. In this case, P2 milk. Warp this continuous weaving with many uh, techniques of the design and natural colors of alpaca, hang span. Because today, there is two types of yarns, hang span yarn 
in industrially produced yarn. Today, even you can find yarn, mixed yarn, like alpaca and wool, even today in the Indian culture, which is probably in the past, in the pre-Columbian times, there was no such thing. Silk um, alpaca mix, or synthetic certain percentage mix with the alpaca wool. So there is all kinds of yarn produced industrially. Today, we use hand spun yarn and those yarn. Today, our textiles are for our own use, which is part of our identity, regional identity, or they produce also textiles to sell according to the demand of the market. In this case, the Chawaitiri, about piece of their weaving, their traditional mantas. Santo Tomas is one of the remote area west of Cusco, eight hours from Cusco. That's the farthest community that we work with. There are amazing weavers, um, but you know, all this region use backstrap loom. This is backstrap loom, and they produce purple weave and warp complementary weaving techniques too. In the center, we have, um, we were able to manage with the weavers, the many intricate group textiles. And every year until before the COVID, we had been calling to weaving competitions. Part of our weaving collection uh, is a result of these weaving competitions. So with that, you encourage, you recognize to the master weavers, uh, maybe once in our life, we do something special and that should be keep it with a little story. This is uh, just a little example to show the large pieces, community pieces done by different groups of ladies from the different regions. Uh, in this case, they are judging the ones who won in the previous year who were not participating in this uh, weaving competition. There are two, uh, you know, hanging in the wall and also in the table here to the right and the left, the miniature pieces produced by the children, miniature mantas, miniature ponchos, uh, belts, ropes, and everything done by the children. So. These weavers have been judging these pieces um, and the, with the colors they are marking the first, the second, so the count, they are going to count, you know, how many of that will win. It's a very complex uh, system, but that's how we qualify. Um, from the normal weaving to the most ambitious projects until today, that's where would I get. I never in my life um, have thought or planned or dream it. What kind of things in my life I was? I will. I am. I feel like privileged. I feel like in uh, very much blessed. Uh, this is a project uh, done in 2019, a gigantic manta in Chinchero, um, traditional manta. <clears throat> That this project came out from a question. Many of us, we are aging and problems of the health is coming out, showing up. And we say, you know, we should leave something special. Um, we say, you know, we could do this, we could do that. And finally, we agree that will it spin, uh, will, will die, will weave in pieces and will come out uh, with this gigantic manta. You can see in the floor, many warps, very large pieces, seven meters length, but the width has to be maximum of 50 centimeters because backstrap, uh, as we know, you know, limits you in the width. So then we really know, uh, you know, to pull like uh, seven meters of warp, you have to be quite strong. Um, and you have to have space and we didn't have space. so. Husband has to come and they have to help us to set up and how we can roll and how we can keep the tension the same way, etc. So it was a challenging project, 
uh, our plan was to do in one year with it. We like to participate in the World Guinness Record. Mm, we didn't because we started this project without uh, knowing how it worked at that. Uh, when we contacted they say, you know, and since we started the project, we got five more. It was, I think, so like, I don't know, 1,500, I mean, 1,500, one, yeah, $1,500,000. So we didn't have even to manage this project. So no way. So this is just to give you idea how large this piece is. It's 13 meters by 12 meters and a half and weighs like 120 kilos, I think so. Uh, the, before the COVID, it was only ex one exhibition in Lima for short time. And since then we are just hosting in our, in the center of the weavers in Chinchero. The other pieces, and this is done in Pitumarca, warp and weft this continuous weaving. And to the left, the original piece from the Nazca, 800 BC, um, 1200, I think, after Christ. And Pituarca weavers, they did similar to that piece, but in the middle, they have put it the square quadrants, um, their techniques that today they use. Um, it's done in pieces, in square pieces. Challenging in this is put it together. Um, that meanwhile, the pre-Columbian pieces, I think it's done one whole piece, maybe in the very large looms. I'm not sure. I haven't touched the original pieces. I haven't studied that much, except that the technique of how it's done, we have studied. And the weavers, the master weavers from Pitu Marga are doing today. This is the Chimu textile reproduction the little ducks or birds, you know, in the same warp and weft to this continuous weaving. Again, this piece is done by many groups of ladies in sections and they put it together. No way today a person can do this except if you pay, you know, months and months of their work. But it still will be probably alone, um, maybe sad weaving by yourself, Meanwhile, as a group, you know, you encourage each other, you lend yarn, you help each other, um, you have a date to finish. So you don't like to be behind and like that. So since spinning is challenging, plying the yarn, warping, the tension is very important. And then the joining finally comes out. Um, since they are done in pieces, you can see in the sections that that's in quite much the same color with the another one. Since 2020, with the Andean textile art, we took, I took this project very ambitiously. <laughs> um, they, since they know how to do it, warp and weft this continuous weaving, the tie-dye part, we didn't know. Um, so, the Pitumarca community region knows warp and weft this continuous weaving. The Salia community knows how to do the tie-dye, the ikat. So we say, it should be possible to reproduce these pieces or to practice, to play with, to figure out. Of course, there's so much challenges. First, when I take this project to the communities, they say, you know, are you crazy, you know? How many things you are going to ask to reproduce, you know? Uh, and they say, where is this coming from? And I say, you know, it's ours. It's the Peruvian weavers made this, you know? And it's just close to Cusco, which is Ica, Nazca region. And they did this masterpieces and they say, wow, you know, they admire, they look, they, we take a lot of photos, books and like that. And some of the ladies always, some of the weavers, they will say, oh, yeah, I know, I, I think I know how to do it. this. We can play, we should do this. We can do this in this way in that. Um, very funny stories, but the Pitumarca ladies start doing with plastic things because they think when they cover with the plastic and the tight parts, especially for 
two dyes they have to do or three dyes they have to do. Um, but, you know, always I say, you know, there was not plastic during that time, you know, there was not plastic and they say, but today there is tapes and there is plastic and I say, okay, go get, you know, whatever you think for the first time is okay. But with the plastic, we have so much of um, problems because when we are dying, uh, if the plastic breaks, the dye penetrates. So many of the dyes will be uh, over dyed. So it doesn't come out the figures as you would like. So in P2 Marca, they start doing, they start weaving. The, first, they start figuring out the warp and weft that this continuous weaving, how they can take apart and tie six, certain sections and dye with certain colors and how they are going to put it together again. It was amazing, you know, um, the first time, you know, mm, okay, the second time was better, the third time always somebody comes out with new ideas and new types, new practice, but there is so much of adventure uh, goes into this because some ladies since they work in a group she was supposed to dye certain color and she put it to the another color by mistake so when they put it together their design doesn't match anymore so those kind of things a lot of times happen but they are mastery and some of them they like they are figuring out in this moment and you know how they can protect their finger, their hand from pulling the threads that they tie so tightly, because if you don't tie very tight, the uh, dice penetrate. So uh, they are coming out to the end that yarn, different types of yarn, different types of threads and alpaca is much stronger and the llama is stronger. Um, no plastic because it doesn't work and makes a lot of garbage, et cetera, et cetera. So it's uh, the almost 30 years. And this year in this project is kind of, we're inviting to the young kids because in another project with the young weavers, we have successful stories, okay? So this is one of their pieces in this warp and with this continuous weaving, um, Ika to tie-dye, warp tie-dye. The another project few years ago, we worked on with the National Geographic collaboration when after they found one of their expeditions and the ice mining in one of our Peruvian mountain near to Cusco in Arquipa. Um, when they unwrap it, the textiles, of course, we like to know how it was made or how, how they were. So this is warp faced uh, reproduction of the Inca textile, but this Ligla, you know, the manta to the left with the Inca iconography also have been made in the tapestry technique, okay? So, that's that, uh, the axo here in the bottom to the right is the dress. In the top of that is the belt. And the belt, they say, you know, Juanita's young woman. So the young group should do it. Until today, stay like young groups only with the belt. Meanwhile, the adult weavers, they will do the axo, the right side and the liglia, the manta, on the other side. Double weave, you know, in the pre-Columbian, some cultures with the pre-Columbian times, they have this double weave. Um, with a lot of talent, they were able to figure out the uh, double weave. In one of the tinguis, and I think so if I am not wrong, in, not in the last one, in the previous one, 2013, um, Jennifer Mori for the first time came to teach a workshop on the double weave. But since then, they had been practicing, they had been mastering. Many of them 
they get crazy because it's like thinking in two layers of cloth. That's what they think. This is too much, you know, to think in the bottom and to think in the top and like that. But uh, young weavers, uh, like from Wakatinko, one of our communities, and the Akcha Alta, is coming out lately with wonderful bags made in this technique of double weave, double cloth. This is not textile, this is cross looping technique from the Nazca and Paracas culture, um, mostly Nazca. Um, this is to embellish the big mantles in the border. Here to the left, the originals. And uh, usually this bird used to be in the border of the mantles. Or oh, there are pieces like this in the bottom, on the left side, you know, the humanized animals in that technique. We were able also to reintroduce this. Um, the finest, finest technique was made in the uh, matches and what do you call the wooden part because you have to create like circle. And uh, Mary Frame had been also in the beginning involved in the warp weft is continuing also a little bit of this technique, so we, we don't go alone. Always there are people going with the weavers along to see. So you can see in this left side lady's hand, how tiny, tiny she's working with the needle. Uh, that lady on the right, she's holding the entire piece, part of that original piece, but the entire piece done as a group. Many of the results, what we are getting today, are um, a community energy. Those ladies who are kind masters and ambitious, they say, we can do it. Why we cannot do it? So this is, for example, the past year, last year we say, okay, maybe the children should master using heavy yarn. And maybe we should fill it in with a napa, you know, inside so they can see the figures well. We have a lot of those figurines today. And in this way, ch the children are mastering. Today, we, they made little tiny things like to create in urns and like that or necklaces, very fine pieces. All these uh, results that have been accomplished in the weavers who work with the Centro Textiles Tradicionales del Cusco, as I mentioned before, it's um, uh, thanks to the energy challenging and the ability capacity of these groups of weavers. Many of them are discussed in the meetings. Many of the projects will be presented by myself to by them. Um, a lot of times we they take votes to continue, or they request and they ask to do certain things, etc. But the capacity and the ability is in the hand, in the memory of these master weavers. All the ten groups are organized in groups in their community and they formed into the Weavers Association like girls, um, recognized by the government. We take uh, meetings or events uh, before COVID, maybe at least once a year, very important events since the recognition to the master weaver. All important events like training, sharing, etc. okay? So they come to the meetings, a commission of the board directors elected every two years. With these ladies also were able to make to happen three large events, tinkus, uh, which means gathering of the weavers. The first one in the Urbamba Valley the two of them in the Cusco at the convention center in 2013 and 2017. I don't know if we will have still energy to handle this again, but there is many questions about that. 
And also, I love, I love from the deepest of my heart that my culture, that my weavers have the opportunity to we to meet the world weavers, famous in many cases like them, or to meet um, scholars and the supporters, textile lovers or cultural supporters. Uh, I never, this dream came from that, that I had the opportunity to go to many events, but how you can take all these wonderful weavers to those events, never in my life I cannot take. So I thought we better do something here in Cusco. They can come, they can have opportunity. They have so much to share, so much to teach, and so much to learn. Um, so what I would say, I get uh, sometimes emotional to see in these things, and there is so much to share more. And you know, weavers have done amazing things, but as I say, not just by themselves, not because the center textiles only, also because there is so much support from many important institutions, people and the textile art and other organizations, family organizations, um, scholars, um, weavers, of course, fiber people, natural dyers, uh, all that. So this is a project uh, like any another project in the world supported by many uh, people that we are still in this world. And today we hope this knowledge that we like to leave to the children. So since few years ago, um, the main focus of the Centro is uh, to work with the children. So in the 10 communities, over 500 weavers, also there is children group around 300 from the age of eight, nine, 10, to the 25, 30 years old. Also in this last years with the Andean Textiles, we uh, started a project with the children who had been children in the past and today they are students in Cusco City um, in the university or any technician school that they, many of the master weavers, um, they have needs, basic needs like home, food, um, uh, our speciality is not to assist in that way, but we would like that they come to the center, uh, they learn about the process of work in the center, and in the future, they could be um, those ones who could be leading the center in different uh, uh, areas. And by the way, we have already a weaver, a young weaver who had been in the past, she has a degree and now she's managing our um, education department since this year and um, also the porch department. So it's such simple to work with the weavers. And when we have to develop products, for some new products, we will work with them. I sit with them, we discuss about the colors. They come out, we do again and again. We don't need. to go to the communities and they speak, we speak this, we have the same respect to the weavers, etc. So the Centro Textiles and the board of the directors and the members, uh, we are so pleased and we work very closely with the Andean Textile Art and with another institutions too. So I guess my time is coming over. Um, we would like to invite um, to the to the, you know, there are many important people in this group. So if you like to just share something, and um, also if you have any question, and if I can answer, um, it's great pleasure. And um, from the deepest of my heart, I thank you um, for supporting. This is our project. 
It's not my project. It's not the Weaver's project. It's not the Central's project. It's our project. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Nilda. That was exceptional. Um, it's really, it's really amazing what you're doing. And um, the photos are are just incredible. I'm glad that you shared about Tinkoi. Um, I was I was there in 2017 at the Tinkoi, and it was truly a life changing experience for me. Um, getting to have exposure to all the amazing artisans that were present from all over the globe, and hear the wonderful lectures and workshops um, involving all kinds of techniques from the natural dyes to the um, woven structures. So it's it's really remarkable all that you've done. Thank you. Um, we have some questions coming in. Um, maybe one um, that would be good to start with. I know that you've um, spoken a lot about the how you truly value um, the youth and the children. Um, and I know that the role of the Young Weavers Group is very important to um, CTTC. So can you share a little bit more about, about the Young Weavers Groups that um, exist? Okay, the Young Weavers Group had been created um, by inspiration of the Bambus Kirks, one of the founders of the Centro de Textiles Tradicionales from Vermont. Um, when the um, Brazil Carnival bracelets <laughs> like this had been by with the native technique and we forgot how to, we were forgetting this project, you know, the story of the central start from the, when the weaving was dying out or changing out, et cetera. So we start and the way how you start weaving is with the very basic and narrow weavings, which is called watanas or hakimas. In that way you practice your backstrap loom like that. Um, that's when we start in Chincher, my home place, long time ago. And many of those um, young kids when I, who I used to teach today are the coordinators of the young groups and they are part of the adult group in Chinchero because they are mothers, they are married and many of them have degree, they have English skills and like that. Um, this uh, reintroduction or this knowledge or this revival of the uh, textile practices, we don't like that we dies, it dies again. Our tradition in the Andean culture was passed from generation to the generation all the knowledge. And that's what we like to continue. So it's very important. We are not going to be forever in this world so that this young group uh, had a conscience in the textile production and the, not just the textile production but identity with it, our textile patrimony that we very luckily inherited from our pre-Columbian cultures even long before the Incas. So we like that they continue. Not just that, also it's community building. I mean, these children functions like kind in the adult group functions. They elect their board directors, they have little treasurer, they have president, they have weaving coordinator, they handle a little bit of their money that they make from their weaving. We like to build up like kind, strong group in them hopefully. So like Akchalta, Akchalta, many of you have, you have been here. They were at the beginning, all of them unlettered people. Today, there are wonderful professional, uh, some of them become to be. We have the first young boy who is part of our sales in the store, and who had just a degree and his master weaver from that group. So. That kind of also we like to give opportunity to continue studying and being part of that group. So it's very, very important, I think. So the young and the young and the children group to start with. And also it's very easy to start with instead of adult group. <laughs> 
Amazing. That's so important for the continuation of, of all of this great work. Um, another question that we have is um, from Luis Philip Pinto. Nilda, I was wondering if you could sh go deeper with the connections between weaving and mythological or spiritual ideas and themes. Also, how do these ideas relate to color and pattern? Well, there is another theme. Actually, there are many themes can come out from this. What I am telling you is just at the surface. And sometimes when I am preparing these talks, I don't know which way to go, okay? Who is going to be my audience and like that? So I just say general things. There is a lot of deep connection in textiles with the rituals and the, in some ways, colors. Unfortunately, the practice is going away, especially with the young generations, because they leave the community or they are not practicing. Also, religion changes. You know, Catholic is very much mixed with the Andean religion. When they came, I'm not um, crit criticizing religion, but when the, another religion comes on the top, like evangelicals, they don't have that much respect to the practice in the Andean culture. So that kind of things makes very quick change. It's a very big theme. Um, it's not easy to answer, but there is still some practice even though it's changing. I, I, I know that there is um, a specific um, ritual involved with the um, horizontal warp uh, that goes into the ground with the coca leaves. Can you share a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's the blessing. Mm. You know, you ask the energy of your apples, the mountains, the mother earth to give you good luck basically during the work process. But you yarn is enough to accomplish those projects and uh, your weaving is going to be smooth and you will finish. So you put it a little bit of coca leaves and chicha also. You power in the corner of one of your pigs in the cloth. So there is another way. Also, there is beliefs also. Thank you. Yes. And for those who don't know, chicha is a drink made with corn. That's correct? Yes. Okay. It's a Indian <laughs> drink. It's delicious. <laughs> um, so we have some questions about the center. Um, I know I've, I've been to your center in Cusco and um, it's truly amazing. There's within the center itself, there's um, kind of almost like a small museum that um, uh, attendees can can walk through during the the hours that it's open and and learn and see um, all the stages of the weaving process and the natural dyes and then there's also a store where they can purchase some of these items and um, the days that I went there was also live uh, weavers weaving that you got to observe um, is there anything else you can share with us about um, if someone wants yes. to attend the center yes the comic you know, blocked us, all of us in the world, mm. to mm. us even worse. Um, but we took advantage of that time and there was generous people who supported us in this projects. We did rebuilding, we did expansion. So the store now has exhibition in the second floor, that's new part besides the museum and the gallery. Um, weavers are just starting coming in the small group in Chinchero, where the project started, uh, also we have expanded the store. We have the expanded the weaving demonstrations in the second floor. We are setting up an exhibition room like for that large piece of manta and, and other pieces that we have replicated. We have uh, special pieces now in that. Uh, November 3rd, we are going to do the official kind of reopening event. Um, for the local visitors, authorities, and like that, to show the new parts of the city, DC. Uh, this is a project not stopping working, but we have very generous people helping us and supporting us. 
Amazing. Thank you. So I have another question um, from Lindsay Colasa. Um, she's wanting to know what plant or tree do is used to make the spindle? Um, and is that a role of somebody in the community who makes them? Um, also, is that the same tree that's used to make the wood for the backstrap loom pieces? Um, and is there a specific reason for a specific kind of wood um, for those, those parts of the weaving process? More, well, uh, your drop is been the look at Mike, but our drop is it's a good question. Our drop is comes from the chasta and from the area before jumping into the Amazon, we say. There is special bushes that the wooden part doesn't break easily. And that's what we like also for our weaving tools. Bamboos, wood comes from um, that eye brown jungle or from the jungle from the Amazon. In the Andean culture is very much appreciate those wooden parts and bamboos and pick up pieces. People, when they go to the jungle, always they have to bring coca leaves, coffees, fruits, and weaving tools, always. So we have a special piece, but it breaks that piece by mistake or by accident. You can replace even with the eucalypt or wood, but it's not that strong like the other ones or with bamboo. Um, we have Quechua names like Tayanka, very, very strong wood and we appreciate it so much and we keep very carefully those drop spindles and the wood weaving tools great so we have a lot of questions more questions coming in um a lot of people are expressing gratitude and admiration for everything that you've shared so i just wanted to let you know that um thank you very much also, I would like to mention, if you have any specific questions, um, use my email or go to the website and you can send me a note and I can promise that I will answer if I know. <laughs> okay. Yes. Great. Perfect. Thank you. That's very generous. Um, so I have another question involving um, that knowledge of the, uh, that this, I know that the synthetic dyes were introduced in the late 19th century and indigenous people all over the world um, started using them for their bright colors and the reliability of the colors and the ease of, um, of utilizing that. Um, she's seen in photos of the many villages in Peru who still use these synthetic dyes. So how do you train the eyes of your weavers to prefer and like the natural dyes or do they only mm -hmm. leave these to sell to the outsider tourists because that's what maybe that market prefers or also themselves? Um, that's because she wonderful. sees most of the, yeah, the indigenous yeah. people seem to have their own, have the natural ones that they use yeah. as their mentils. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a yes. very interesting question. <laughs> and it's whoever is asking, it's wonderful because it is true. You know, our weaving is like fashion. Fashion also goes in every culture, I think, is in the Andes went like that. Um, chemical dyes at the beginning, uh, even in our pieces, there are chemical good dyes that doesn't fade, doesn't go away. But in the last um, decades, chemical dyes came down in the quality. So they start mixing up. That creates or that forced to the weavers to use acrylic synthetic yarns already dyed. So what was happening, it was the alpaca fibers, the wool had been um, so uh, they had been selling to the uh, yarn companies. And there were middle people that they will take synthetic yarn and they will try it with their alpaca and wool materials, instant synthetic yarn. Why? Because the colors were running. The amount of the work in the textiles is the amount the, the, in the way how you produce the patterns, the design. So if your design is going to be ruined by running many colors and 
guided by that, no way that you like to do all that effort in creating very intricate designs. So they were going from the chemical dye to the synthetic dye. Um, after that, we went, and I worked in the first years with the chemical dyes for a long time. Even I have left over of the dyes that I got in some companies of the chemical dyes. We are using natural dyes since only 1998 after research, interviews, and taking classes, etc. cetera. Um, it was challenging as a, any change. I wouldn't say, oh yes, the weavers, I were so happy to get. No, believe me, in the first dye workshop in Chinchero that I say, Ladies, bring you yarn. We are going to start dyeing with a natural dye. They brought their worst quality of yarn mm. because they were afraid they were going to damage. So the project continued. We dyed. Of course, we got the soft colors first time because we didn't know quite how it worked out. And then, you know, we say, okay, with that yarn you weave. And then they wove. And then we say, we are going to keep this weavings in the permanent collection. And they said, no, 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 no. We're going to do another one if you are going to keep in the permanent collection. I don't like to see my name in that textile. I say, no, <laughs> I would like to try to you. A lot of times they will come and they say, can I try to you? I say, no, you know? <laughs> so they did the process of acceptation of the natural diet colors went slowly. Some communities accepted faster than the other communities. The attraction on this, it's not easy the natural dye. It's not easy to get very intense colors. You have to over dye, you have to mix with another dyes, you have to do three times, etc. The attraction of using natural dyes, I will say accepting the natural dyed colors is because they are color fast. They can wash anytime, they can get the dirty, wash however they like, and the colors never going to cover the design like used to do the natural time. With that, I'm not going to say like Pitumarca, uh, I'm going to say the Pitumarca region is the most complex weavers um, region. But during the carnival, when you go there, I was amazed that how much of the textiles came out with the synthetic yarn woven pieces, carnival, bright, bright colors. And even for the weddings there is. So it's going slowly, acceptation again for these colors. It's not easy. Thank you. Can you share a little bit, there's some more questions about the dyes. Can you share a little bit about what plants um, are some of the main plants that you like to work with? Yes, we have, uh, I'm going to answer generally, uh, mm -hmm. roots, we have flowers, we have cochineal, we have indigo. And by the way, our indigo research and experimentation project is um, stopped there. And we have wonderful indigo, native indigo in Cusco region in the Quillabama Valley. So if anybody interested to get involved in that project, uh, because we did the research and experimentation sitting there to be continued. It's not continued. So um, we have flowers, we have to gather, we have to gather leaves, we have to gather some mordants, etc. In one of my books, in the Chinchero Textile Tradition book, there is one page explaining about the mordants, about the dyes, and etc. Also, if you send me, I can send you the photo and like that. Uh, I can't go detail to Brawl, I will need another hour. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to use this moment. I'm glad that you mentioned some of your books because I have some of your books and they're incredible. So I want to make a plug on, on here for those of you who are listening and have been inspired by, um, as, as Neil just said, she's just scratching the surface, giving a very general um, description of all the many things that the projects that she's been doing and the elements of um, the nuances of the different aspects of the Andean traditions. Um, and she's written several books um, that focus on different uh, portions of these things that are incredible resources. Um, and you can find those on the website. Also, uh, the website 
has a lot of um, great information about the process and um, the different fibers, uh, the different camelid fibers that are involved and um, the 10 different villages um, that are, or communities that are a part of the organization. You can read more about, about them. And so I just wanna make, make that apparent to everybody that a lot of this information you can um, access more in depth in that way um, by, by buying some of her books. <laughs> um, and also on the online page there, there's even a store um, where some of you can purchase a poncho or certain bags or some of the, the mantils um, um, at all different sizes and scales. Some of you can purchase um, some of the, the narrow wantanas from the Young Weavers groups, which is great support for the Young Weavers. So um, there's lots of ways to support um, and, uh, and see for yourself the beauty and the fineness of these textiles and these processes. So I just wanted to share all of that before we get too late <laughs> in the game. So maybe you <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for all this work for so long. Um, it's been so many years. Uh, maybe there was one question about um, when the uh, when officially uh, was the Centro de uh, Textiles de Tr Tradicionales um, of Cusco, when was it officially founded? Okay. The official legal funding happened in 1996. But the project started in Chinchera, my birthplace, very informally, without thinking a project, just in, with a dream, with a passion, of liking to weave and liking to learn. Um, like in the early 80s, 90s after 90s came out the idea of a project. So at the beginning it was called Chinchera Cultural Project, but never became to be official. Then we, with a little bit more thought or dream, we thought the uh, center, the textiles traditionales de Cusco will be the center. And if we, the energy or whatever allows us to expand to the different regions where the weaving was dying out or changing, we will just uh, focus our work. So we work with one community in one type of textile. We cannot work in many communities with the same type of textile because there are many areas actually who needs assistance. We got stuck with the 10 communities because the production um, improved and the weavers uh, like to sell their textiles, high quality textiles. Um, we need also younger energies and hopefully our board will that. They did such a generous, generous work, our past members, the founders and like that, um, were aging as all of us. So um, it's uh, just, uh, you know, that's how we start, like any another project, you know, but it's a work of the day and night and by a group of people and like you followers, that somehow you are going to be uh, supporting this project. Amazing. Well, there's been some so many exciting things that um, I know that you've that that you've been a part of, and um, it's it's really incredible to hear. Um, one last question. Um, I know that when I was at the last Tinkoi in uh, 2017, there was um, special workshops for the master weavers to learn the Paracas Nazca looping techniques was what was called the Paracas Nazca looping project. And then I know there was a competition then held among them to see who could master this lost technique that then was only found in, um, in archeological you know, specimens. And uh, yeah, would you share a little bit about the resulting uh, pro process of that, of that project and, and how it, ended up becoming a museum exhibition? <laughs> yes, and we would like to continue with this um, weaving competitions because that's where we get a lot. Um, it's coming, it's every project has a story and will continue this story. It happened during the COVID, everybody was in spirit and the children group, they say, what we can do? 
we are bored, we have time. Uh, if we do this, if we do that, could you purchase or could you buy? We need, you know, to work. And we say, oh, it's good time to practice many things. So we say, okay, challenging project. Could you young kids or children start with this uh, interlocking looping technique? And they say, yeah, some of them they say. And one of the community, Wakatinko, young group, kind of mastering now, you know? They are just coming out very familiar with that technique. They have done such little tiny things, but now they are doing also larger things. So um, it's more spreading out, it's more coming. Our thick fingers of the adult people, I think, <laughs> It's okay. hard to handle those very fine yarn and the needles, but the little thin fingers of the children, it's uh, much easier to handle those things. So mm. uh, it's amazing that's how it's coming out. We need to do still more work. We need to do, the thing is that uh, there is so much capacity to produce. The thing is where you get the money, to purchase or to pay for all that thing to encourage them to continue this. So still is our, our, uh, in, our in our hand, in the textile people's hand, you know, how we can work. So please request anything, you designers, you um, conference holders, you, I don't know what kind of events you get. Always think in the Andean children and group that they can do like name tag pieces, little hakimas, or they can do earrings, they can do bracelets, they can do. Fortunately, during the COVID time, we got good support. One company from London ordered like 700 meters of yardage from eight communities and just they ordered another 300 meters. So those kind of uh, joint efforts is what making a life that also we are starting with the classes, workshops on a person online. Um, our education department is restarting again. Uh, little by little we are picking up so we are, will be offering more service, we'll be doing, giving more opportunities for our followers and our supporters. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you shared that. So for all who are listening today, um, I think the time of, is ripe for collaboration and clearly there's incredible skills in the Andes. So um, I think it's exciting to think um, to think more community-minded, how, how we can be um, mindful of all aspects of what's happening on the planet and especially those that are good for the planet and the, the, the use of these natural dyes rather than the chemicals and everything done by hand and, um, and all the love and work and labor that goes into it is really um, important. <laughs> So thank you so much, Nilda. Thank you, uh, New York Textile Month. Thank you, Ragna, for helping host this and for all the technological help with the Zoom. Um, I want to say one more plug for um, the, the website um, is www.textilescusco.org. And that's the um, Center of Traditional Textiles of Cusco um, that Nilda has been speaking about. So I wanted to make sure everyone had that. And um, thank you, Nilda. Thank you so much. This was incredible. Hope we can have you back. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I hope soon, someday, we can see in New York or in other places or down here in Cusco. Um, just to keep, you know, your support to us. Um, you know, I hope we will do it another thing. We, uh, maybe New York Textile Month can join to that to bring in, you know, I, ha yeah, I, just, I have to step in Nilda, and thank you from all my heart about, you know, for your lecture tonight. It was so special and so generous of you and Robin for introducing us to Nilda and bringing her into our program. That's amazing. Thank you both. 
Thank I you would so much. appreciate so much that. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you to all. everybody. Have a good night, and we hope that soon we can see someone. Yes, thank you so much.